Hello and welcome to energy and atmosphere credit category. It's a bit lengthy chapter. As we can see, we've got three prerequisites for, uh, I beg your pardon, and we've got nine credits. And rightfully so, because you can gain 38 number of points, uh, which is the maximum in any credit category throughout this uh, program. And if you pinpoint optimize energy performance is uh, the credit where you can earn maximum number almost 20 points only in this category so what's the purpose why they are weighing too much on this energy and atmosphere uh, for the triple bottom line people planet and profit we are mainly focused focused or lead is primarily focused on uh, reversing the climate change and basically if you use less energy the way energy produced these days is uh, by burning fossil fuels or natural gas or other ways and it's harmful for the atmosphere because of the uh, carbon emissions so the less you uh, use the energy less you are uh, putting or making any impact on the atmosphere so this is how they correlate and in my opinion if you can use less energy if you can use energy more efficiently then why not even there are, there is some debate going on nowadays that uh, the way we are predicting uh, how carbon is harmful for our climate change it is still subject to debate whether it will act the way we are thinking or it may not and the impact is after centuries but putting all these aside if you can use something efficiently if you can uh, have the same output by using less energy then why not so let's on with uh, go move on with the first uh, prerequisite i will go one by one and i will rearrange as i did in the previous uh, credit category i'll put the relative credit immediately after the prerequisite so the first prerequisite is energy efficiency best management practices which is to ensure that the operating strategies inside the facility are energy efficient which means that you are having the same output energy efficiency means you are having the same output but you are using less energy so the requirement is to have uh, since it's for uh, lead apo plus m so operation and maintenance plan including the following the first one is current facilities requirement cfr having the sequence of operation how things will operate and the occupancy schedule which is important because uh, it's going to depend a lot on your occupancy if you have how many people you have in the building what are their schedule if they come five days a week if they come six days a week and accordingly you will run your uh, equipment uh, so hence the equipment runtime that how long it will be used eight hours a day nine hours a day again six days a week seven days five days based on your occupancy schedule then how much you have put for the set point for your heat ventilation and air conditioning systems because changing the set points may have a big effect on your energy consumption uh, considering a, a case in which you are cooling a building from a, if you had a set point of 18 degrees centigrade and you moved it to 22 or 23 still the thermal comfort levels are acceptable inside the building but it will have an impact on your energy bill so you can use energy efficiently by keeping the same uh, thermal comfort and lighting levels you have multiple lighting levels could be on off and somewhere in mid, in the mid levels if you are using uh, the sunlight or, or daylight then your lighting levels might go down the energy bill might go down minimum outside air requirements for ventilation any changes in schedules if you have a vacation coming if it's if it's a long weekend if it's the end of the year the uh, schedules might be changed or just like we saw in pandemic the schedules were changed uh, people were uh, working from home so it will have a big impact on your energy uh, usage preventive maintenance plans basically just to prevent anything that might happen in the future like changing your filters or anything else and system narrative describing MEP system which is mechanical electrical and plumbing and the requirement is to conduct an energy audit identify I, I know everybody knows what audit is just to see if the things are going as per plan or if you uh, are trying to find some improvement in it identified in ASHRAE level one ASHRAE is American Society of Heat Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers uh, they have their own standards it's a private entity but whatever standards they uh, release they are used extensively by the governments to uh, employ in uh, different 
building line. So within five years, if you have done any Azure Level 1 audit, it is accepted. In the next slide, I'm going to discuss uh, in uh, not too much detail, but at least to have an idea what is Azure Level Energy Audits and what are the multiple levels of audit and for what reason they are done. So within five years, uh, if you have done Azure Level 1, it will be accepted as a requirement and procedures for commercial building energy audits. So this is the prerequisite that you have to follow. You should have a plan. And if you have done any energy audit, Azure Level 1 it will be acceptable. So documentation is summary of uh, preliminary energy use analysis and Level 1 building energy audit and current facilities requirement plan and maintenance plan. For data centers, you've got uh, another uh, requirement, which is to have uh, to use DOE, which is Department of Energy. Uh, they have uh, came up or they have developed a tool or software data center pro profiling tool to perform initial assessment of energy consumption. Uh, you can find the software on the link below and it will give uh, an uh, idea about how it works. You've got here inputs, you put it into the DC Pro tools like what is uh, uh, the system information like IT, how much is the cooling, what's the power, if there is any on-site generation or not, utility builds data and stuff, and it's going to give you an output having an overall picture of energy use index or uh, an efficiency, what is the breakdown and uh, potential areas where you can improve or uh, being more energy efficient. So in this case, you have to submit the output from when you put all the inputs by using this website, you can uh, visit this and see how it works. And you, when you put all these inputs from your facility, it's going to give an output which has to be shared in case of data centers. So let's have a look at ASHRAE Energy Audit. First of all, the purpose is to reduce energy consumption and save money. Now, if you walk into a facility and say that I'm going to give you a solution in which you are going to reduce the energy use and it, should, it would be really helpful for the atmosphere or climate change or something like that, and you do not give them a number how much they are going to save in the money this will not be attractive to anyone who is running the business. That's why if you are walking for an energy audit, you should not only tell how much energy they're going to save and or help the climate or atmosphere, but the only thing catchy or the only thing that's going to attract them to invest in, uh, in this energy audit or in these uh, energy efficiency measures is when you're going to show them how much money they are going to save. So, uh, this is the purpose that you identify the measures and then you later uh, later uh, implement them and try to save some money. Now, uh, there are three levels of audit. There, there is one preliminary uh, energy use analysis, usually called level zero audit, in which you just take out the energy bill and see how much kilowatt hour per square meter is used and compare it to similar buildings. In the level one audit, which is called walkthrough audit, you move on to the facility and you need someone who, is, uh, who has previous experience and he can walk through the facility and can see potential improvements. For example, if they saw in, the, in their first tour that the facility is really very cold, like 16 or 17 degrees, which it, it can be set uh, at 20, 21, and it might uh, save you some dollars and it will not affect on the thermal comfort. They can see that the lighting use is fluorescent or incandescent and can be changed to LEDs. Uh, and if there are other like pumps, if they can find out that uh, there are more energy efficient pumps available. So this is the basic level of uh, uh, the audit, which is level one, rough costs and savings for energy efficiency measures. So you can see uh, if there are any capital improvements possible, uh, which then going on to the level two, by the way, level zero costs nothing, one, almost nothing, two cost you, uh, more than level one and three is the most expensive one. So this is how it moves. And uh, who does that? This is done by mainly companies called ESCOs or EPCs. What is ESCOs? These are energy services companies or EPCs, energy performance contractors. Uh, EPC is not used uh, extensively now, nowadays because it is uh, usually confused by 
uh, engineering, uh, procurement and construction, which is uh, a famous terminology for uh, the big contractors. So you call them ESCOs. What ESCO does is uh, they provide you guaranteed savings. They will uh, go through your facility in case of level one and uh, in case of uh, level two, uh, it's the same thing that they're trying to find out the opportunities to save some energy and in turn some money for you. But in this case, it would be a little detailed. They will give you energy use breakdown. How much is being used for lighting? How much is being used for uh, heating? How much is being used for laundry equipment or something like that? Whatever uh, you have uh, usage going down for uh, your facility. And it is going to give you cost and savings for energy efficiency measure. They will specify that if you do this, what we say in the lighting, if you change retrofit, the lighting is going to save you this much. If you retrofit the motors, if you change the, the chiller, for example, it's going to give you this much. And if you do these operation and maintenance changes, it means it's more explained, it's more detailed, it's more uh, broken down into pieces. Level three is the most detailed one, and it's more refined, and it includes uh, simulations, computer simulations based on softwares that is going to predict, and uh, uh, that's the reason that uh, you need uh, professionals to the simulating professionals or simulation professionals to prepare this audit report. Now, after this audit, they provide guaranteed savings, which is a uh, simple payback, return on investment costs, uh, benefits, and risks. So they will they, they will come to you and give you a complete uh, report saying that if you apply these savings, going to give you this much. If you uh, invest uh, today, uh, the payback will be within this much time or this much period. So the energy conservation also serves triple bottom line, which we discussed that uh, the less you use the energy, the more it's going to save and the less uh, carbon emissions because it's made by fossil fuel burning. So it, this is how it relates. Uh, so the level one and level two audits are for existing buildings. Mainly the existing building don't go for level number three audit. And usually it covers everything in these two levels. Uh, because as I said, they are trying to find out if there are any capital projects or any major retrofits. Level three is usually done for newer buildings when you do not have a baseline you try to simulate based on uh, some other parameters so this is uh, what ashray energy audit is i think that it might give a good idea and let's move back uh, i have some pictures also which uh, this is another way of uh, putting the level one two and three energy audits and it's self-explanatory that level one is smaller two is bigger, three is bigger, and in terms of money also, when the ESCO gives you an options, level one costs less, two more, and three the most. This is the energy use breakdown example. Uh, it's going to give you how much percentage is uh, of energy is used by your equipments like refrigerators, freezers, TV computers, lighting. Uh, it could change. It could differ from place climate to climate because if you're in a hotter climate, then the cooling load will be too much or the maximum and vice versa. This is one of the sample or one of the energy simulation software where uh, the simulation is being done for maybe lighting analysis, how much energy use breakdown could be done. This is a sun path showing on top. So uh, in level three, this is done. Others are uh, done by uh, taking the actual measurements on site. So I think this gives a complete idea and uh, I thought it might be important to understand the ASHRAE energy audits. Credit number one is existing building commissioning analysis. Now what are you are going to do? The purpose is to improve building operations, energy and efficiency of the resource. Option number one, we've got multiple options. Let's go through one by one. Uh, existing building commissioning for two points, which is to have a commissioning plan and we'll implement it in another credit that is uh, existing building commissioning analysis. So first of all, to develop a plan in which you will have your updated current facilities requirements and you will have a commissioning team members and their roles signed clearly in this plan. Now, why commissioning is required? Simply just because whatever you plan, is it working according to the plan or not? That's the, that's the reason you have commissioning in place. What are the approach? Uh, what is the approach for facility improvement opportunities? 
and if there is any process of reviewing opportunities and when it will be implemented what's the schedule and what is the eventual deliverables of this commissioning process this is a plan complete plan and you have to submit this as a documentation as well as well for data centers uh, in, in addition to the previous requirements there is another tool doe department of energy save energy now programs online dc pro energy assessment tool that is to be filled and submitted for dc now for data centers there there are some more stringent requirements because similarly for data centers we've got extra requirements in energy as well uh, for example the the first and foremost is that uh, the cooling uh, in data centers is, is required all the time 24 by 7 and uh, if you apply any energy efficiency measure it's going to create a big difference now it is relatively a good option or uh, a good option for new buildings or relatively new buildings and for retrofitted buildings the reason being that you have just finished your project and you just need to make sure that it is working as per the plan or not documentation is existing building commissioning plan which is you which is what you have developed if there is any updated current facilities requirement what are the team members what are their roles what are they going to do what is their schedule is are there any issue logs in between and what are the planned improvements for the facility and the energy use breakdown of the facility. So option number two is the energy audit. We have seen energy audit now in detail and we know what it is. For the prerequisite, it was energy audit level, ASHRAE level one. For here, if you want to earn two more points in option number two of this credit, you can, you can have Asher level two energy audit plan and it will have almost the same requirements as per the plan updated cfr audit team members for their roles there it was commissioning team members here is audit team members approach and everything is similar to option number one but here you're not making existing building commissioning uh, or existing system commissioning you are performing an energy audit and we know what is energy audit level two where the energy use breakdown will be calculated the uh, ecms or energy conversion measures will be calculated potential savings as per the breakdown now this is good option for old buildings or potential retrofits or capital upgrades I mean you are performing this energy audit which is going to give you uh, a result in which you have potential for big savings when you apply those energy conservation measures for example the biggest one would be in case in uh, in a place or in a climate where cooling is an issue means it's a hot climate then if you propose after making an energy audit uh, level asher level two that the chiller needs to be changed then this is what uh, capital upgrade is all about so this is good for or, or, or good option and definitely it will not happen when you have a currently newly uh, constructed building because definitely this would have been taken care of when in the construction and even if it if it was not taken care of in that energy efficiency uh, keeping that in energy efficiency in mind uh, the owner might not be interested to make another big upgrade after he has just finished the building so documentation will be similar to the previous one but in case of commissioning plan you have now level two audit plan so this is the credit number two existing building commissioning implementation you had a plan now which you have uh, finalized in credit number one for two points either it would be a commissioning plan or it was an audit plan now you have to implement that plan and uh, the intent is similar to improve building operations energy and efficiency of the resources so what we have to do here is you have to implement no or low cost operational improvements no or low cost that are not capital upgrades so you have to implement them for now and develop a five-year plan for equipment replacement and major modifications which would be required by the energy audit uh, asher level two and you have to develop tracking, tracking and verification program if it is working as per plan and it has to be applied on all energy consuming systems which mainly includes lighting process load heat ventilation and air conditioning this is the biggest one all the time district hot water and if any renewable energy is installed now if you don't have a plan definitely you cannot implement it so projects that did not uh, achieve any uh, credit or did not pursue the credit number one uh, of uh, analysis they are not able to earn 
this credit as well because if you had a plan then you can implement it if you did not if you did not you cannot apply for this credit as well now documentation is whatever no cost or low cost measures you have applied and summary of all retrofits and upgrades and the description of staff training if any and revision you have done after all these retrofits to your current facilities requirements and operations and maintenance plan definitely if you have made any retrofits or any upgrades the operation and maintenance plan will change for sure so this is to be submitted as documentation of existing building commissioning implementation for two points so ongoing commissioning is the third credit for three points when you are done with existing building commissioning plan and implementation then you have to come back to ongoing commissioning which is during the course of your performance of the building when in uh, the regular running operations of the building you make this time to time you have uh, operations and maintenance plan which makes sure that the ongoing operations is also as per the plan so requirements of cr1 to be to be met which means that you have existing building commissioning plan in place and establish ongoing commissioning process including the planning how you are going to implement or what is your plan about the ongoing commissioning how would you monitor this commissioning process system testing as i said that you have to test all along the way all during the operations that if it is working as per your initial plan or not you will verify the after testing that it is working as per the plan and if you have any issue log or if you have any issues which are, which are recorded in the issue log then you uh, apply corrective actions to bring back it to where it was supposed to be how it was supposed to work you will measure and you will provide the documentation which could be in this case an issue log and uh, the answer to it that it has been solved or not and you will provide some staff training which means that how they will uh, make the operation and maintenance or verify and how they will measure how will they they are documented so all this has to be done in this ongoing commissioning commissionings must uh, occur quarterly for first year and later annually so you have to have an ongoing commissioning process at, at least for this credit first uh, year it should be quarterly so it will be done four times and later once per year and it should be applied to uh, apply to all energy consuming system we have seen before lighting process loads as back dsw which is just heat uh, hot water and renewable energy if it is applied uh, if it is applied uh, projects not complying with cr1 uh, will not earn this credit so cr1 is connected to cr2 and cr3 as well documentation is ongoing commissioning plan list of activities that you have done uh, the staff training or system uh, testing or measurement or uh, issue logs and anything and tasks that have been completed then confirmation that operation manuals uh, of current facilities requirement uh, and operation and maintenance are updated as per the ongoing commissioning plan and if there if there any issues were found and how they are uh, measured how they were verified and how they were corrected prerequisite number two is minimum energy performance and the purpose is to reduce the environmental harms how if you use less energy we have discussed this before there will be less emissions so uh, reducing the energy use by establishing minimum operating energy performance for this particular prerequisite you should have 12 months history of your building's energy use can be calculated by the help of your meter bills the way we calculate it for water now there are two possibilities either uh, you compare or your building is comparable to other buildings as per the energy star now what is energy star I'm sure you have seen the logo, uh, the one you can see in the left uh, top left corner of the picture, Energy Star. Even I have a printer, it has Energy Star logo, which means that it is energy efficient. That appliance is using less energy and delivering the same amount of work or task. So this is developed by EPA. Now, if your building, <clears throat> which is serving certain categories, is, if it is an office, it is a school, or uh, any other task that uh, particular this building is performing so for that uh, categories we have different ratings in uh, energy star 
and to which they will compare. You will add the total gross floor area of your project and what, for what purpose it's using, how much is the occupancy. When you enter everything, then it will uh, evaluate based on uh, the data inside the Energy Star and will give your building a score and how much energy you are using. Definitely, this is the main input. So it will compare and give you a score. Uh, this is the case one that your building should score minimum 75. Now, there is another possibility that the category of your building is not listed in Energy Star. So it will be case two, not eligible. In that case, you will be comparing it with similar buildings or national average. So we will see it uh, further. What does uh, national average means? And there are further options uh, one and two. Uh, coming back to this Energy Star, uh, if you, I'm, I'm not sure if you're able to read it or not, so I'm going to read it for you that uh, these five cities have the most Energy Star certified buildings, means you have, uh, uh, so they have scored more uh, than required. Washington DC 480, Los Angeles 475, Atlanta is 328, uh, New York is 299, and uh, San Francisco is 292 and this is the logo I was talking about in the middle on the right you can see how this tool looks like uh, you put all your inputs and then it's going to compare your building saying that your building scores 94 which is uh, much better than the average in in that area which is 64 so the more information the software has uh, the more infographics and all the uh, the better your building is performing, it can calculate for you. So it also calculates that how much you are uh, generating as carbon footprints, which is 27 million here in this case, pounds per year. So uh, this is what uh, it looks like when you, you have to make an Energy Star portfolio or uh, energy star account for your building no matter what even if it is eligible or not eligible because this has to be shared by us uh, gbc option number one is to benchmark against uh, typical buildings now why we are making this benchmark because we know that our building or our project does not fall in a certain category it's not comparable or energy star rating is not available in that case we'll go for benchmarking against typical buildings uh, serving the same purpose. Uh, we have path one and path two. Uh, path one is when national average data is available. Now, what is this uh, data? It is the median energy performance. Now, what is median energy performance? It's like uh, the usage of the middle of the national population. So whatever the number you have uh, in terms of usage, 50% is doing better than that and 50% is using more energy in, uh, than that just uh, for a quick uh, example if 100 kilowatt hours is the usage of uh, or the median energy performance of the building it means that 50 percent of the national population is using less than 100 kilowatt hours and 50 percent is using more and based on this path one the energy performance of our project should be 25 percent better means that we should show that we are using almost 75 kilowatt hours which is 25 percent better than 100. Uh, path two is that even when you do not have the median energy performance available, in that case, you will try to find three similar buildings. Uh, it could be anywhere and they have to be normalized for climate use and occupancy, which means that the three similar buildings that you are comparing to should be almost in the same climate zone. Maybe they are in a different place, but the climate should be the same. And it is very obvious and very logical because if you take a very hot climate and try to compare it with uh, a building in a very hot climate and try to compare it with a building in a very cold climate, their requirements of energy are not the same and hence the usage will not be. So we have to normalize it for the climate. Uh, the building should be uh, serving the same purpose and almost the same occupancy because otherwise it will not be a fair comparison and 25% improvement should be shown. So we have to show 25% improvement in either case. Each building should be separately metered and calibrated registered building in Energy Star portfolio. This is the case when uh, you have more than one building and register building in Energy Star portfolio manager tool and update regularly. By the way, even if your project uh, rating is available in Energy Star or not, regardless, you have to uh, register your building in Energy Star portfolio manager because part of the documentation is that you have to share with the USCBC the Energy Star portfolio manager profile 
access. Now, uh, all these previous uh, requirements in path one, path two, and even for the uh, when energy star rating is available, it is based on 12 months data. So meter calibration report based on which you have calculated everything should be available. Copy of utility bills because based on which uh, we have uh, taken out our uh, energy use. And similar buildings compared comparability for path number two and normalized EUI uh, energy use index showing that they are using the same uh, climate uh, in, in the cl same climate, same use and almost the same occupancy and copy of utility bill summary covering all the 12 months. So we know we have to show improvement, whether it is energy star rating or path one or path two, national data or similar buildings, we have to show improvement in that case, 25% for path one and path two. There are some general strategies to do so. If you see in the pyramid below, unlike the common perception, which says that if you install renewable energy, that's going to offset uh, a big difference, but it's not the case. The biggest difference that is going to make is energy conservation and then the energy efficiency and then in the last comes the renewable energy now energy conservation means that you are using less you are reducing the waste of energy if uh, you are trying to uh, minimize for example the set points uh, that is going to reduce the use of energy if you are trying to uh, reduce the levels of your water heaters so it means that you are reducing your demand you are trying to uh, compensate for some of your thermal comfort, or, for example, or something that was extra, you're cutting it down, you are reducing things down. And this is not the case with, with energy efficiency. It means that you did not cut any of your demand, your requirements remains the same, but you use energy efficient appliances or energy efficient products or energy efficient ways to do it. So this is the slight difference. The, but the first thing and the biggest thing that is going to make the difference is that you have to cut your demand and the second is energy efficiency and the third one is that you are producing anything on site and then using it so demand reduction is an energy conservation harvesting site energy is renewable energy increasing efficiency is energy efficiency by using the same amount of work but but smartly or efficiently recovering waste energy this is an interesting one and that's why this is when you try to use that energy that is normally wasted in the atmosphere or wasted in the drain or anything similar now in the figure on the right if you see that uh, the black is the drain water uh, hot water is the red line and blue is the cold water now what happens is cold water is for example coming at 13 degrees centigrade and the hot water is heating the water to 55 now even after your shower the water that you have used the hot water it does not go back to 13 it's almost somewhere around maybe 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. So this water, this wastewater, can be uh, used to exchange the heat for the cold water, which is now preheated. So this preheated water that is the green line is going to the water heater. So it means that if you would have put 13 degrees centigrade water and then uh, heat it to 55 degrees Celsius, you would have used more energy but the wastewater which was at 40 has uh, uh, made, a, made a heat transfer to your uh, cold water and maybe it has brought it somewhere around 25. So now you have to heat 25 degrees water to 55, which will use less energy. So this is what it means to have uh, recovering the waste energy. Similarly, the figure on the left in which you have uh, considering that you are trying to cool a space and the return air from that space is not hot it's not as hot as the air intake from the from the outside so this return air is not totally exhausted but some of this return air is mixed with the air intake and thus reducing uh, the temperature or uh, uh, lowering the temperature down of the air intake and which means that if you are cooling it it might now need less energy to cool it back so this is how you can recover from uh, any waste or uh, any energy that would have gone uh, to the atmosphere or to the drain. And there are certain, uh, certainly different ways to do so, but these are the examples which uh, try to uh, establish what is uh, meant by recovering waste energy. Option number two is to benchmark against historical data 
by comparing 12 months of your own performance with the past three continuous years out of five, which means that your building should at least be four years old. You have previous three years uh, performance, then you have one year of your own data, and then you have to compare it and show 25% improvement. So for the prerequisite, all throughout, you have to show 25% improvement. In this case, you have to compare with your own building performance. And documentation almost remains similar, meter calibration report, because this is based on which you are calculating your usage. Energy, energy star portfolio manager profile access is mandatory, whether you are in any of the options, copy of the bill, source EUI, uh, energy use index, and calculation supporting improvement. Credit number four is optimize energy performance, the maximum number of points you can achieve in any credit, up to 20 points, and we'll follow the same pattern of uh, the prerequisite. We've got two cases. The case number one is when energy star rating is there, and the minimum requirement for the prerequisite was to have uh, the score of 75, and for case two, not, when it's not eligible for energy star, we've got two options. So when you are scoring more than 75, then this table will uh, determine that how many number of points you earn. From 76 onwards up till 95, you're able to earn from 3 to 20 points. So if you have an energy star rating and you score, for example, somewhere 85, you'll get 12 points. And as per the table, you're going to earn the points. So this uh, is where you can earn maximum number of points. And if uh, you compare to the certification levels from 40 to 49 you earn the certification so half of them are can be earned only from one credit documentation is meter calibration report because it's based on which you are submitting the energy star portfolio manager access copy of utility bills and energy performance option number one following the same path one to 20 points maximum if you had opted for path number one in prerequisite any uh, improvement above 25 percent will earn you points up to 20 points we'll see the uh, the table based on which uh, it will be awarded for path number two you can earn maximum 14 points starting uh, better than 25 percent uh, the figure below you see it's basically shows the median uh, national average data example this is one of my assignments that i did in which i took out this median uh, national average data from epa website and uh, you can show improvement from uh, the energy use intensity of certain so this is the first table uh, if you have gone for path one one to 20 points starting from 26 to 45 45 percent basically these are the percentages so up till 45 percent improvement you can earn 20 points and for path number two, where you are comparing with similar buildings, showing 20, more than 25% of improvement is going to earn you from 2 to 14 points. But this is not continuous. It's 2, 4, 6, 8, and 14 points uh, based on 27 to 45%. Uh, the documentation almost remains similar. Normalized EUI is required in this case. And uh, the copy of the bills, the meter calibration report, and the manager profile access is uh, kind of constant. And if you have gone for option number two in the prerequisite where you benchmarked against your own project the previous out of previous five if you have gone for three continuous years uh, energy usage and then showed improvement then any uh, improvement over 25 percent is going to earn you points based on the similar table that we have seen in path number two two four six eight and 14 points are possible but in credit you've got one more option that is basically the combination of the two. Option number three is to benchmark against both historical data and similar buildings, and the table based on which the points will be awarded is similar to path number one. Any percentage improvement above 25 means 26 to 25 is going to earn you one to 20 points. An exemplary performance is possible of one point. If you achieve 97 score in energy star rating in case one, or 47% in this option, in uh, case number two, option number three. Requisite number three is building level energy metering, similar to water metering. And the purpose is to support the management and to identify if there are any more opportunities to save any energy and to track the usage. You cannot control what you cannot measure. So you have to have an existing permanent metering system for all energy needs, or you have to install new for all the 
energy needs inside your building or inside your project, including electricity, which is the most common one, but you can have meter for fuel like natural gas, and you can have for uh, chill water and if there is any requirement of steam. If you have installed any renewable energy on your site, then the metering for that is not required, at least for this prerequisite, will be covered in the credit. And the uh, uh, meter should be able to record at least once per month the readings, which is usually done by the utility companies, so monthly billing can be used to track usage. And the minimum performance period for the calculation of your energy usage is 12 months advanced energy metering for two points credit number five advanced from the prerequisite the intent is similar the requirement is to have advanced energy metering which are the sub meters for all the energy sources that use 20 or more percent of the total consumption and in this credit renewables are included they were not in the prerequisite the meters should be permanently installed the prerequisite will also but these meters are kind of more smart must be able to record and report hourly monthly or annually it means they would usually be connected to your building management system and electricity must record both demand and consumption because usually the utility companies they charge you also uh, per demand what is your kva and what is your consumption so it might identify an opportunity to save if you are using less and your demand is more in the uh, next month you can reduce your demand as well data collection system must be LAN or local area network bms building management system or wireless so multiple uh, data collection points should be available and systems should store up to three years so this is kind of smart or having more space uh, more reporting possibilities and more communication possibilities and must be remotely accessible which be which will be in the case of wireless so it's uh, as the name suggests advanced energy metering considering x more number of meters and with more characteristics and another attribute for this uh, meters the advanced energy meters to set an alarm when consumption and peak demand rise more than five percent and demand measurements to be calculated or collected hourly however for uh, data centers the it energy consumption we saw that before so since uh, in data centers there are some special requirements like uh, i told in uh, the earlier slides that because of its it equipment the hvac uh, consumption is also different so similarly for energy it energy consumption from ups metering should be separate from non-it equipment for the documentation list of all advanced meters that you are installing on site and how they will be programmed what are their uh, you can submit their data sheets and uh, the alarm programming how it is done when the alarm will sound more than five percent or maybe you can uh, tweak it to four percent just in case uh, and that project has monthly annual summaries for energy consumption and monthly peak demand data so you have to basically compile everything based on these energy meters uh, summaries and submit to the gbci for compliance prerequisite number four is fundamental refrigeration management which is basically the compliance with the montreal protocol to reduce uh, the ozone ozone depletion and uh, i have explained what is the ozone depletion potential what is the global warming potential what is montreal protocol what is it all about why it is important in a video called pre-lead i will add the link in the description so uh, the purpose is to since cfcs are harmful for the ozone layer which protects us from the harmful rays so we have to uh, reduce our use or in fact stop our use of cfcs for all the hvac systems unless a third party audit shows since it's an existing building so maybe the equipment hvac equipment is installed which use cfcs so if it says that system conversion from the CFCs to the non-CFCs is not feasible financially in the terms of simple payback period. So in that case, you can keep it, but you have to have a phase out conversion in 10 years time. You should have a plan that your equipment having CFCs will be phased out in 10 years time if you're not able to do it right now. And any new equipment, 
uh, that you are installing on your site. So if you have to change your chillers due to their age or if there is any default and you are changing them, then now the new one you cannot install CFC based. So no new equipment CFC based. And if there you have an existing one, it should have a phase out plan of 10 years. And small water coolers, standard small refrigerators that less uh, that use less than half pounds of uh, CFCs or similar appliances less than half pounds are exempt from this requirement. So the purpose is that it should not be uh, exposed into the atmosphere and uh, you should not use it. The documentation is the list of equipment types that use and a confirmation that new equipment does not use CFCs if you have installed any new equipment. And in case of phase out, the complete plan should be submitted. What is the phase out date, how it will be done, what are the machines and uh, when it will be done. And economic feasibility of conversion uh, or replacement, including costs and savings should be submitted if we are following and if it is uh, determined that uh, replacement is feasible. Credit number six is advanced refrigeration management. This is the continuation of uh, the previous prerequisite. Uh, the requirement is to choose the refrigerant based on low GWP and ODP, which is global warming potential and ozone depletion potential. The simplest option is not to use uh, uh, the refrigerants and or use the refrigerants that have zero ODP and GWP is less than 50. No calculation is required for the documentation, just the confirmation that only low impact refrigeration is used in your equipments in your projects. The option number two is calculation of the impact of a certain refrigerant that you are using in your site or in your project. So the combination of new and existing HVAC, HVAC uh, equipment in project must comply with the formula life cycle global warming potential plus life cycle ozone depletion potential times zone of five should be less than equal to 100. There are so many factors that contribute to life cycle global warming potential and uh, to it's a complex formula and for sure uh, they will not be asking it in the exam as well but the idea is that you need uh, LCODP or uh, life cycle global warming potential, refrigerant leakage rate, refrigerant charge, equipment life which is taken usually 10 years default. After uh, putting in all these values in that complex formula you can come out uh, with the, the number and verify that with uh, your the, with your refrigeration uh, gas or the refrigerant that you are using uh, is not harmful for the atmosphere or at least within the limits. But the projects with CFCs with a phase out plan means they have an HVAC equipment for now that is using CFCs will not be able to earn any credit or any option in enhanced refrigeration management. So in order to earn this credit, you have to make sure that you have no equipment running on your site or on your project that is having CFCs. And for retail, just like BD plus C, there are some extra requirements. The first one is to have non-depleting refrigerants, no ODP. Store-wide annual emissions rate should be less than 15%, means that the leakage rate basically should be less than that. And if average refrigerant charge rate should be no more than 1.7 pounds per thousand BDU per hour. And we know that documentation is uh, to have the uh, list of the equipment type you're using, what is the cooling capacity of that? What is the refrigerant type? Because we have to show that it is non-ODP. And basically the material safety data sheet is going to be enough. Then VRF systems, if they are used, you know that they use more refrigerant charge. So VRF systems should provide the refrigerant charge calculations. And for retail, the green chill certification proof, which actually gives a certification to all the equipment that is used in retail that if they are using the right kind of uh, refrigerant and the leakage rate is the minimum or in the acceptable range credit number seven is demand response one to three points and i explained demand response earlier in detail in my other video i'll post the link and i'll explain a little bit here what happens is that we know that during certain in under certain climate conditions and during certain seasons and during a certain time of the day the demand is high the ideal example is that you are living near equator it's uh, summer 
season and you have noon time. So the demand is naturally at its peak. Now what happens is the utility is not able to fulfill the demand. There are two options, either they uh, make load shedding or they send a signal if they have a system, they will send a signal to the consumer saying that we are facing high demand and, and the consumer in response to that demand, that's why it's called demand and response. So a consumer in response to uh, that demand shed some part of its load, uh, which could be uh, if it depends what is uh, the system that you are having in your building. It can shed some load like you can switch not to do washing at that time. You have some decorative lighting going on or switched on. You can switch them off. So you have a system in place and it should set, shed some load, which is the response to that demand coming from the utility. So for the requirement is to evaluate building and equipment for participation in that program. There are two possibilities. Uh, we discussed the examples. One is load shedding and the other one is shifting. Now, in the example of turning off the lights, this is load shedding. You are switching off the light completely in that particular time where the demand was high. Whereas you are shifting your washing, if you are doing laundry and you are moving this laundry from peak, peak time to off peak time, it means you are shifting the load. You're not skipping laundry. You are doing uh, the laundry, but you are moving it to some other time. So this is load shifting. And on-site electric, uh, electricity generation does not apply here. We've got two cases. One is that the utility provider has the facility of demand response. In that case, as, as uh, our project and our building, we must agree to participate in demand response program for one year with an intention of multi-year renewal. And we should be able to shed almost 10% of our estimate peak electricity demand. And buildings uh, as a system mean we've got a demand from the utility provider. We should be do we should be able to do uh, or reduce this load shifting or load shedding uh, by some system, or we sh it should be able to respond automatically or semi-automatically. Means uh, we will we will take the system or we will read the signal from. Uh, the utility provider and we should have uh, a system in place in our building that should be able to respond at least semi uh, automatically to that demand and the minimum reduction is 10 percent times the peak demand which means that we are shedding 10 percent of our load and these are the three possibilities we've got manual uh, response we've got semi-automated response and we've got fully automated response the first one which is not acceptable is that you receive a dr event by email, phone, text, or via internet now. And someone himself may, may, uh, makes a decision that either they will participate or they will not. Means it's, it's not automated. Somebody, if this guy is not here, nobody is going to know whether there is a DR event or not. And the DR or the response to that demand is initiated by people. Mean uh, if in case you receive a, a demand, a person, receives it via email text or uh, over the internet and he sends another signal to some people shedding off some load like he asks some uh, it's a facility operator so he asks some of the workers to switch off some lights or uh, in, in case he asks them to stop the laundry so this is the manual system which is not acceptable the semi-automated is that there is a person who receives the signal from uh, the utility provider but he has a building management system through which he can switch off the loads whatever is uh, enough to uh, switch off the 10 percent of the peak demand then there is fully automated you've got a building management uh, system in place that will receive the signal from the dr or from the from the utility provider and it will implement as per the plan it will reduce or it will shed or it will shift the load 10 percent and there is no human inter intervention whatsoever. So the first one is not acceptable uh, as in uh, to earn any points in this credit. The second and third one is. So case number two is no DR available. The utility provider has no system to send you any demand signal. By the way, the first one when DR was available and you were responding uh, to it or shedding some uh, load like 10% of the peak demand, either semi-automated -auto way or in a fully automated way you're able to gain 
three points. But in case there is no DR available, you as a building or we as a project should be ready that in case if DR comes, we are able to respond it semi-automatically or fully automated. So provide infrastructure for future programs. If it comes by the utility, you are ready, you can sign the agreement and you can shed 10% of the load. And it has to be reflected in current facilities requirement and operation and maintenance plan. The case three is permanent load shifting. This is what I said that you will shift the load. It is basically not efficiency uh, involved here. You're not uh, trying to reduce your total load or you're not trying to uh, reduce the use of your energy. Basically, you are just opting to use the energy out of the peak period. Uh, this graph actually explains uh, the load curtailment is when you actually reduce the load uh, or the time uh, in which you have a peak, you reduce the total load. The same example that you are switching off the lights and it's not possible that you need light to, uh, at 5 p.m. and you will get the light at 3 p.m. No, that's not the case. So at, uh, in the switching of the light, you are actually curtailing the load or reducing the load in that real time. But in case of the washing or anything that you have shifted from this time to some other time, it will be called as load shifting. So case three in permanent load shifting, you know that you have certain uh, time of the day you have demand. So you distribute your uh, energy usage in a way that you skip uh, the high energy usage, uh, like using some uh, certain kind of appliances and move it on to the other times where there is no peak demand. So demonstrate that 10% of your load is shifted by the system. There are some other ways as well, like uh, you've got water storage in case of chillers. You can use uh, water and ice storage systems in which uh, you save the energy in off peak uh, time and then uh, switch on to the storage and use the uh, energy stored in ice or water system and run but this might be a little bit complex so the simple way to learn is that you have shifted the load so identify all load shifting measures corresponding peak and off peak loads for each major whatever you have done if you have uh, shifted the laundry if you have shifted any cleaning or uh, any other equipment you have to mention and it should all uh, end up like 10% of your total peak load. So the documentation, one of them is consistent in all the cases, the evidence of the ability to shed 10% of the peak load because either your load shifting, either the response uh, demand response system is available or not, this evidence should be submitted and it should be reflected in uh, current facilities requirement and operations and maintenance plan. Something that is exclusive for case number one because you have uh, a system that can respond and you also have the utility provider that has uh, the DR system installed. So you should submit a proof of enrollment in that program uh, for a minimum one year and it should be renewable to multi-year. The intention should be multi-year. Now, something exclusive for case three, which is permanent load shifting for two points that you have to submit what load you are shifting and uh, something for case one and two only, uh, which is that your building is ready to shed some load in case of DR event. You have to submit or perform uh, a complete test and action plan in case of a DR event. Credit number eight, the last credit of this category, renewable energy and carbon offsets. We're going to see uh, in detail what is meant by renewable energy and carbon offsets. The main purpose is to offset or reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, which otherwise would have been used from the local grid, which produces electricity by emitting or by burning any fuels. So the requirement is to demonstrate at least one or both of the following, that at least some portion of the building energy is met by the renewables. Uh, your, you can have a PV system in place, you can have wind uh, turbine, small turbine in place, or there are some other renewables we're going, to, we're going to see in the next slide. Then a minimum two year contract in place to purchase green power. Now what is green power? REC is renewable energy certificates. Oh, we have next slide to explain or carbon offsets annually. Uh, must have come online after January 2005. Uh, means these uh, RECs and carbon offsets. And any renewable energy sold back to the grid does not qualify. It means if you are uh, producing energy, then it has to be used by 
your project then it will be counted if you are selling it to the outside then it will not be counted uh, now uh, RECs or renewable energy certificates can be used to mitigate scope 2 emissions only now what are scope, scope 2 emissions then carbon offsets can mitigate both scope 1 and 2 emissions I think we'll have uh, all the answers in the next slide but uh, in order to calculate the number of points it's easy renewable energy generated percentage or how much we have uh, uh, offset is divided by 1.5 percent and energy purchased or offset uh, from the carbon offsets divided by 25 percent so if you uh, buy uh, the carbon offsets for all 100 percent even for your project the maximum number of points you're going to earn will be four but collective you can earn five number of points so first have a look at scope one and two emissions the first one is directly emitted from the building like burning coal or burning gas for heating or some other purposes and scope two are when you are using the electricity it's not under direct control control of the project you're using electricity which is coming from a grid or coming from a utility provider who is uh, or who is producing that electricity by burning fossil fuels and releasing or emitting the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere so it's not directly under your control it's not the first product you are using now what are RECs and carbon offsets it is established that uh, RECs can only mitigate scope 1 emissions and carbon offsets can mitigate both scope 1 and scope 2 emissions so what are RECs under normal conditions you have the utility provider he puts on the electricity produced on the grid and it is used by the consumer now if there are more than one suppliers and more than one uh, way of producing electricity in this case we have one renewable source and the other source is by fossil fuel so once they are on the grid there is no way to differentiate that which electricity has come from uh, the renewable sources and which electricity is coming from the fossil fuel sources they are completely integratable and uh, it's like mixing the two waters uh, from different bottles now you cannot tell that which water came from which bottle so they generated uh, RECs or renewable energy certificates I think one megawatt hour of uh, electricity when it is produced you've got one REC and we as a consumer can purchase REC and claim that we are the one who are using the renewable electricity so this is what the, is the concept of uh, the RECs whereas the carbon offsets uh, which can also offset uh, the scope 2 emissions is like you are emitting the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases in one place whereas some other projects in some other parts of the world are mitigating the effect of carbon dioxide somewhere else like uh, you are mitigating in China Oh, sorry you are releasing in China and it's being mitigated somewhere in Bhutan because you are planting the forest there you are uh, making a facility that is producing uh, the electricity by photovoltaics which otherwise would have been produced by some fossil fuel sources and it would have generated this much greenhouse gases uh, and it would have been harmful for the atmosphere so there is a equivalency that how much you are mitigating the effect which otherwise would have been uh, released as a greenhouse in the atmosphere so this is the concept of carbon uh, offsets that you are mitigating the effects of carbon in somewhere else around the world and this uh, these kind of projects like energy efficiency project alternative transportation biking projects or renewable energy production uh, can mitigate uh, the effects of uh, the carbon dioxide produced in some other parts of the world so uh, now I think it's uh, a bit clear what are RECs and carbon offsets and how they can uh, mitigate the scope one and two emissions. So the way how these RECs are generated, it also has to be certified by somebody which claim or which certifies that they are being produced the way they should. So green power or RECs should be certified by green E and carbon offsets should be certified by green e climate uh, in order to be authentic now the allowable renewables uh, we know that the most common are these the first two the wind uh, because it's uh, also uh, very much adopted in europe and you can see it from very far so it's it's not uh, 
uncommon these days and also the photovoltaic cells uh, but we have biomass which is basically the hydrocarbons but it is taken not from the fossil fuels but by burning garbage we've got from crops uh, corn biofuel all uh, alcohol fuels landfill gas and and from wood even so basically they are hydrocarbons but taken from different sources uh, we can see that there are wave and tidal energy the wave that are being uh, produced by ocean they can also be used to turn some turbines and uh, turn it into some effective uh, electricity production and then we have got geothermal we know that under certain depth of uh, the first layer the temperature is constant and we can use to transfer the heat and we have the low impact uh, hydro which is basically the dams we as we know and you can see or have a look at this green e and green e climate certified details on the following link green dash e dot org so the documentation required would be the total energy use because we are using renewables percentage as an offset from the total energy so we should have a reference point of the total energy use which can be taken from any a prerequisite in the minimum energy performance if we have calculated or in other calcul in other credits where it was required uh, to your commitment with green e power rec or carbon offsets and the points calculation that are based on the formula which was the renewable uh, percentage renewable energy percentage by 1.5 plus carbon offsets by 25 percent now even if you have used all the hundred percent uh, with the carbon offsets uh, divided by 25 is the maximum number you can earn for but in case of renewables whatever is the number the collective number by adding both of them cannot be more than five so that's the reason we have a cap of five points and exemplary performance of one point can be earned if you have offset or use use 10 percent of total energy that is produced by renewables which would be quite an achievement so this brings us to the end of this credit category and uh, we will be continuing with the credit category of materials and resources. Thank you very much for your attention.